Okay, and welcome to the ninth edition of FreeBSD Office Hours, uh, where we get together some developers and take questions and have discussions with the community and contributors and anyone else interested in FreeBSD uh, and usually answer some of your questions. Uh, so this week, we're going to take some questions from the chat room, which is just below the live stream here on live.freebsd.org. Um, and then maybe we'll also uh, look at some PRs and do some other stuff to uh, fill up our time here. Uh, so to start, uh, I saw uh, an interesting question coming in on the mailing list from uh, Mike Tenska, uh, who asked, has anyone been using the packet filtering features that are built into the Chelsea T520 and T540 network cards uh, on FreeBSD? Rather than using IPFW or PF, I was hoping to offload some of this packet filtering to the engine that's built into the NIC. Um, does this end up saving CPU processing power in the end? Uh, is there a sweet spot for using it? Or am I better off just using IPFW? I'm looking at dropping traffic in the two to five gigabit per second range, filtering up bogons and some other known bad packets. Uh, I'd appreciate any examples or tips, as well as any caveats or documentation um, for using this with FreeBSD 12. Uh, and in a follow-up, he found a post over at the BSD router project uh, where Olivier Cachard LeBay, who's a FreeBSD developer, has a post here about dropping, dropping packets at a high rate, uh, basically showing how to deal with denial of service attacks uh, using FreeBSD. Uh, so in his particular case, he's got about 14 million packets per second of legitimate traffic that are trying to go through his network that he wants to allow. But mixed into that is uh, 42 million packets per second of attack traffic. And so he needs to, you know, Short, sort the sheep from the goats. Uh, so his first rule is uh, to deny everything from a blacklist table of IP addresses. Then a second rule allows everything through. And the third one uh, disables the packet filter interface uh, on outgoing packets. So that uh, in his case, because the firewall is just protecting against bad stuff coming in, uh, he can uh, use a feature that was added in, I think, FreeBSD 10 that allows you to have all outgoing packets bypass the firewall and just go straight out, allowing uh, you to save the overhead of uh, passing all the outbound packets through the firewall. And there's an example config uh, here for that. Uh, but it also contains an example of doing this at the network card level. Uh, so actually using um, the feature of the network card. Uh, currently, the PFL memory pointer hook feature is supported uh, by NICs that use IFLIB, VTNet, or the Mellanox Chelsea drivers. And it basically allows you to use IPFW rules, but pass them down into um, the network driver. Uh, and he did some performance benchmarks. Uh, comparing uh, on a 16 core 2.6 gigahertz server, uh, comparing filtering on the Chelsea versus filtering uh, with software. And so uh, just using IPFW in software, uh, he was able to average about 10 million packets per second, but by uh, pushing it down, uh, the IPFW rules down into the network card, uh, he was able to see about a 20% gain uh, in throughput. Uh, and then the other option is to actually use the TCAM firewall that's built into the Chelsea NIC engine. Uh, so with this one, the rules are different, but he creates uh, a rule and pushes it down into the NIC. And then when he runs that through, uh, runs his test again, uh, he sees about 32 million uh, packets per second going through, uh, rather than the 12 he got using uh, the IPFW rules. So there was a big performance gain there. And then with uh, some other improvements to his rules, he managed to actually filter out the entire 42 million packets per second. Uh, and if you want to read more about that, it's there in the post, which is linked from the mailing list. So, uh, 
anybody in the chat room have questions, please uh, fire the questions off into the chat room so that we can help you with your FreeBSD questions. I see another one here of a user who is upgrading from FreeBSD 11 to 12, uh, and they have an older setup where the, um, because they were using um, full disk encryption, Gelly, back before the FreeBSD bootloader supported that, uh, they have a separate unencrypted boot pool. Uh, and so it's, I think, confusing uh, FreeBSD update when they try to uh, do the update. It can't find the kernel. Um, somewhere here in my notes, I have a link to an article on how to fix that. Is and I'm put that in the chat room as well. Okay, so Ryan Proxy is a question that came in uh, from the ZFS on FreeBSD GitHub repo. Uh, someone's using FreeBSD 12.1 P8, and they say, I had a mirror of two Geli partitions. I had, uh, or I've replaced one disk with a bigger one, resilvering it uh, completely, but mixed up with the Geli encryption keys. After reboot, the new VDEV uh, didn't get attached. So the pool is running with just the one old VDEV. I have detached the new VDEV uh, for fixing the Geli keys issue. I fixed it and rebooted it again, but I uh, forgot to attach the new VDEV back to the pool. After booting, this pool uh, was switched to a failure state and it doesn't want to import now. I've tried to do some magic, uh, including a forced rollback, uh, but it fails saying uh, that there's just errors in the pool. Uh, I tried to use the ZDB E uh, to look at the uh, debugging output, uh, and they found uh, the best Uber block at a certain transaction, but was unable to read the Metaslab array. So I can't import the pool and can't use, I uh, can't add new VDEVs to uh, an exported pool. Uh, as a result, I have one broken pool on one VDEV and two detached VDEVs with recent data but old VDEV, uh, or the old VDEV and the new one. So the question is how to fix the broken pool. Is it possible to add a second good VDEV to an exported pool and try to import it again? No, uh, if the pool is exported, you can't modify it. Uh, can I assemble a new pool with data from an old pool and have these two detached disks with data? Uh, no, but you should be able to import the pool using one or of the disks that has the slightly older version of the pool that was detached. Um, it might be slightly more complicated if it's actually been marked as detached. Uh, but in general, since it's a mirror, all the data should be on the disk and you should be able to actually import uh, the pool off one of the two disks that isn't uh, damaged or whatever happened to the, the one remaining disk. That one likely requires a, a more interactive debugging session to, to figure out what went wrong there. OK, 
because in general, nothing should be missing from the VDEV that didn't get changed. Ah, there. Ryan has sabotaged you, uh, Ed. If you'd like an update on Git. <laughs> yeah, so we, um, uh, the Git working group is meeting um, every uh, every week um, to work through things. Um, the, uh, the initial task we had was getting the subversion to Git conversion process into uh, a good state and it's there now. So the we're confident that the actual, uh, the converter is able to take our existing subversion history and produce a high fidelity representation in Git. Uh, we might end up tweaking things a little bit from here. Um, so we're not yet guaranteeing that the hashes won't change, um, but at a very high level, um, the, in, in broad strokes, the the conversion is um, is in uh, in good shape. Um, release engineering team uh, is working on getting a snapshot uh, built out of the Git conversion. Uh, so that's one of our prerequisites to to explore, exploring a few different uh, different things. So we want to we need to have that done to try out FreeBSD update. Uh, in the Git world uh, to make sure that we've identified anything that's going to fail um, with changes to revision uh, IDs being embedded in, in binaries um, and things like that. Um, and then we're, we're working through a few um, other open questions as well. One of the things um, we've recently looked at is the possibility of continuing to build releases and and other things um, out of subversion for the for the lifetime of the stable eleven and stable twelve branches. Um, stable eleven, no more releases are coming, so it doesn't really matter an awful lot. Um, if we're going to do the work anyway, then it's not really any extra work to do eleven in addition to twelve. Um, but but basically, what it means is that for the lifetime of stable twelve, we would build releases from subversion, so 12.2, 12.3, um, for example. And the reason we're looking at that is, is it would be the, it would provide the most seamless uh, experience for downstream users who, who would just continue tracking um, the subversion repo that they currently have. And us doing that is predicated on building up some tooling so that we can mirror Git commits back into Subversion. Um, so we've we've talked quite a bit about having a Subversion view of the repo available, and I think that's one of the things um, that that we kind of um, admit needs to happen. Um, the first approach we had looked at basically creates an entirely disconnected Subversion um, mirror. So effectively, it's 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 the current mirroring we're doing it, but in reverse. Um, the downside of that approach is that the subversion um, uh, revision IDs and such will be completely disconnected. It would be a, a brand new subversion view of um, of the FreeBSD history. And there's a few downsides um, to that. So that's why uh, Warner is now looking at, at trying to build up some tooling to do a imports on a commit by commit basis from Git back into subversion. Um, if that works, then the developer workflow would be for MFCs, um, you know, the, the commit would happen in, in Git, and then the developer would do um, the Git version of an MFC, a cherry pick, and then the converter would automatically replay that back into the subversion repo and the, and the release would get, uh, or snapshot would get built out of there. Uh, Warner's um, on the chat channel. Um, and says he's working on on that as we speak, uh, in fact. Um, Warner, if there's anything else you wanted to mention uh, in here, I will happily proxy it uh, for you. I think that's, prob that's probably our biggest um, open issue right now. 
Um, there's additional documentation that still needs to be done, a few workflow things, um, and um, some administrative things. So the commit hooks and setting up the repository host and that sort of thing is, is in progress as well. Does that include the, the mail from for a commit or whatever? Yeah, so we um, we need to have uh, so the, a commit it would be a commit hook that's that's responsible mm -hmm. for um, for generating that. Um, but yeah, the, having um, having commit mail is something that uh, we definitely need to have in place. Um, and I, I expect actually that we would stand that up um, on the current beta, the converted um, the SVN to get conversion for now, um, and then and then the same commit messages will just come from native get commits in the future. Um, Do we have any other uh, questions in the chat? Seems a bit quiet today. Everybody's on vacation. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, some interesting news. Uh, if there is the um, work that the FreeBSD Foundation has been sponsoring me to do to integrate uh, the Z standard compression into ZFS, uh, looks like it's uh, wrapping up the next stage here. Um, the It looks like the, the actual commit to merge it into upstream open ZFS should land uh, maybe even this week, and if not early next week, uh, and be part of uh, their open ZFS 2.0 branch that they're going to create uh, relatively soon. Uh, and that is also what will be pulled back into uh, FreeBSD uh, to replace the older Illumos based ZFS that we've been using. Uh, so this basically allows us to pull in all the latest uh, OpenZFS features, and uh, among them is the new Z-Center stuff, which should uh, cut in very soon. Um, that's been a, an interesting project. I started it uh, based on somebody else's, well, the idea somebody had at the OpenZFS hackathon in 2016. Uh, I think that year I didn't get to go to the OpenZFS developer conference because it overlapped with EuroBSDCon. Uh, so I wasn't uh, able to make it. Uh, but based on you know, some ideas that were discussed at the hackathon, I thought I'd give a try at integrating Z standard into ZFS. Uh, at the time, Z standard was still uh, before its 1.0 release and um, used a lot of stack variables and as space on the stack. Uh, and that was not conducive to running inside the kernel. Uh, and I did some work to try to mitigate that, uh, but it was a bit messy uh, and I kind of got stalled out. But um, over the course of the next couple months, upstream uh, did a bunch of work to actually improve that situation also for running on smaller platforms like little single board computers and so on. Uh, and then once that was solved, it made it easier and I did some more work and uh, integrated the feature into ZFS and got it working on FreeBSD. Uh, I got it most of the way there, although there were still a number of open issues and some kind of integration problems. Uh, but I got busy with other things, but somebody uh, from the ZFS on Linux project, uh, took the, the code I'd written for FreeBSD and ported it to Linux. They had to uh, change the way the memory allocation worked quite a bit uh, because Linux doesn't have something like FreeBSD's UMA that can handle allocating large chunks of memory uh, frequently. Uh, but other than that, it was mostly my uh, original code. Um, and as we got closer to the next major version of OpenZFS, the 2.0, that's going to be basically the version for 2021. Um, there was this desire to get it finished. Uh, and so with the help of the foundation, 
I went back and resolved a bunch of those uh, problems, like the interaction with the L2 arc or the problems with uh, originally the compression type and the compression level were separate properties uh, to avoid having to expand uh, how many bits of data we had to store in the block pointer, because the block pointer in ZFS isn't something that can really be changed, uh, because you'd have to, you know, it would make uh, the new pool completely incompatible with the old one, and you'd basically have to throw away every existing ZFS pool and make a new one, and that is not something that's going to happen. Uh, and so the workaround was to store the level separately, uh, but that was causing problems with inheritance. In particular, if you set, uh, for example, uh, Z standard supports more than the normal number of levels of compression. You know, if you're familiar with like gzip or bzip or xzip, uh, you know, you can set compression levels between one, which is fast, and nine, which is slow. Uh, and the default's usually six or whatever. Uh, with Z standard, the levels go from one to 22. Uh, and go from really, really fast to really, 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 really slow. <laughs> um, and then they even went so far as to make negative levels that are even faster. Uh, and the there's not really a limit on how fast you can ask it to be. You know, you can have level negative 1 million, although it's not really any different than negative 100,000. Uh, but anyway, um, it didn't make sense to try to store uh, the level as part of the block pointer because it's kind of this very large amount of information to store. Uh, but if you set, you know, compression to Z standard level 15 on a data set, uh, so you set compression to Z standard and level is 15, and then later you change the compression type to gzip, uh, well, there is no level 15 for gzip, and how would it handle that and make sure it doesn't break? Uh, but Thanks to the help of the Free FreeBSD Foundation, all those issues have been solved, uh, and a bunch of new tests have been added. And actually, uh, an unrelated bug with the L2 arc was fixed last week uh, because of my work. I basically stumbled over this other bug when I was adding tests uh, to prove that Z standard was working correctly with the L2 arc. It found that in some cases, the L2 arc, even with uh, LZ4 compression, wasn't working correctly. Uh, and so that was fixed as well. Uh, and hopefully that will be merged any day now. Uh, so the next question also from Ryan was, uh, what is the timeline looking like for FreeBSD 13's release? Uh, do you have any insight on that, Ed? So there's a schedule. Um published. I, I assume you mean FreeBSD 13 in general, not specifically re related to Git uh, topics. Um, yeah, I assume he means in general, although yeah. Git will have some bearing on that, right? Yeah, and, and I mean, getting the um, uh, snapshots going soon is kind of, you know, we, re we really want to get that done so that we can start finding any, any issues that we didn't anticipate. Um, <laughs> The um, so the the release thir the thirteen schedule as planned is on the the website, um, which calls for the branch to be created um, uh, January twenty second uh, next year. Yeah, and then uh, the beta is starting in February, and then RC is through March, and hopefully a release before the end of March. I think uh, there's quite a lot of good stuff in in current right now um, that will be very nice to have uh, available in a release. Yeah, uh, you know, there's definitely been talk about the fact that it sometimes seems like there's a, too much delay between uh, when the good stuff lands in head and when it finally makes it into a release. Yeah, I think um, you know if you talk to many developers, FreeBSD developers using FreeBSD on our own. Um, laptops or desktops, it's quite common to be running current on laptops and desktops. And, and part of the reason I think is exactly that, that there's all kinds of either new hardware support or just general new features that are, um, are interesting and desirable um, that, that mean folks often run, um, run current and, and, you know, that there are good and bad sides to, to doing that. Um, I think it's, for the developer community, it's really important because it means that 
um, you know, we're in the best place to find and fix and and fix things that that we do find if there's there's issues. Um, but it certainly also uh, can be a little more bumpy, uh, and and you're not necessarily guaranteed things are going to work on any given day. Yeah, and uh, there was a discussion uh, last week, I think, uh, about the problem with packages on current. And I think if we want to get people using uh, current more, we'd have to solve that problem. And even just uh, the general issue of upgrading between uh, the snapshots of current. I know there's been some work to get FreeBSD update to be able to handle that, uh, but maybe package based is also the right answer. Did, did you have something, Nicholas? I was just wondering what uh, issues regarding packages what you were referring to. Uh, this is, uh, it came up um, uh, from some Cirrus CI tests. Um, I think in TCB dump, they noticed it. Um, and the, it's, it's just the um, lack of synchronization between uh, current images being built, um, in this case for GCP. So, uh, and, and the ports um, build. So what ended up happening is is they're trying to um, the, the test run is trying to use the um, latest ports tree, um, the current ports tree, and the GCP image um, was and perhaps still is um, a little bit behind. Um, so ports are depending on symbols that don't exist in um, in the base system that's available on that platform. Um, and I think there's there's a few different um, different things here. Um, you know, if if we are uh, as the FreeBSD project, if we are releasing um, our own images, we can certainly um, put in policies or tools or whatever to to synchronize those. Uh, but when we also want to use those packages on cloud environments that um possibly have their own schedule of of snapshot releases we need to sort something out there yeah yeah and as you can also run into you know if people are going to run the snapshots then maybe they haven't updated yet and now there's the abi change and to run into problems so some way to sort that out um yeah, I guess there are different use cases for, for all of these things. Um, for the CI uh, cases, I think I'm a lot less worried about any kind of upgrade issues um, because we're going to, you know, we're going to run a test and then we're going to throw away whatever it is we, we did. Um, and really the requirement there is just that we're able to get a base system and packages that um, are no newer than that, that base system. Um, and ideally, ideally packages that have at least passed some um, basic sanity test um, as well. That would be ideal for for the CI use cases. Um, and I think it's I think it's important for us to figure this out because uh, the alternative I think is that downstream software project or software projects, third party software projects, um, they're running into this because they're testing. Um, in this case, TCP dump on FreeBSD current. And I think that's that's a great thing. We should encourage that. The alternative is we say, yeah, this is too much of a moving target. Um, you know, you, you can easily test on stable 11 or, um, you know, the, the most recent release on a stable branch. And that's good to make sure that TCP dump will, um, will continue to work on existing releases. But it's also really good if we can get that mm -hmm. testing to happen on, uh, on current. Well, yeah, it's the same reason why uh, it was so helpful to get other projects to be using FreeBSD in their CI, because um, if you can find an issue as close as possible to the time of the commit and notify the developer yeah. about it, they're still thinking about the code from that commit. Whereas if you know you don't manage to tell them about it until half a year later or more when the next release comes out and it triggers this bug, then the developer has moved on to some other bit of it and they've you know swapped all of that code out of their brain and it's a lot more work for them to fix and a lot less likely that they will do it. Whereas if you can point out to somebody, even if it's you know TCP dump that, oh, this change that you made yesterday means it doesn't work on FreeBSD now, they'll probably be able to fix that very quickly without, uh, as much hassle as if we didn't tell them that until mm -hmm. six months later or more. So 
So yeah, and, and I don't know what the best solution is. You know, we talked about maybe just keeping package builds for uh, multiple different versions of current using the, the you know the internal FreeBSD ABI number to pick the right one, but we don't necessarily build packages for every one of them, and that will mean there'll be some that'll be missing, and that'll be weird. Or do we just say, you know, in the snapshots, we'll pre-configure package to just grab the 12 stable packages, uh, and you know, pre-install the the compat 12 package, and then just be like, now you have 13, but you're using packages compiled for 12. That is more likely to work in the case of something like Cirrus CI, but is it maybe not actually testing 13 as legitimately as packages that are compiled and might actually use, say, the new interface in libc that you know was added in, in 13? And how do we decide what the right thing to do there is? Um, Another project that I, I had done some work on, although I haven't uh, managed to get back to in the last couple of weeks, uh, is changes to the package tool on FreeBSD to generate uh, repositories that are more easily able to be served via a CDN. Uh, the, the problem with the way package works by default right now is that uh, you know you update a package file in place. The, the package file is named you know the name of the program dash the version number dot TX set or whatever. Uh, and so if when things get recompiled, um, they might be slightly different, but the file name, if, if the version of what you're compiling, like Firefox, didn't change, uh, you now have a different tarball you've uploaded, but the the contents aren't exactly the same. Uh, and so if you have a regular caching CDN, you're going to be serving the old version, and that's going to trigger a checksum failure and, and squawk at people. Um, and that's not helpful. Um, I thought it was especially interesting because package already has this ability to put uh, part of the hash into the file name uh, that's used in the um, the download cache that package uses. And so I thought, surely it can't be that hard to extend that feature into when creating a repo, name all the files that way, maybe use a symlink um, so that when package downloads its manifest, uh, which we would just configure the CDN to not cache or only cache for a minute at a time or something. Um, that would tell it, hey, download this file with this specific hash part of the file name. And this would solve two different problems. It means if you are getting uh, packages from the repo and it's you know in the process of being updated or whatever, you can still get the old copy of the file and it'll work. Um, so you don't get that problem where sometimes package hasn't detected that the database has changed and you need to run package update-f to make it download the new metadata. Uh, otherwise, it downloads this file with uh, and then complains about the checksum. Um, so this would solve that and allow us to use a CDN, which would then make it easier to uh, handle traffic in places like Asia, uh, where we have a very limited availability of mirrors uh, and performance is bad, but also even just things like uh, different cloud providers like Amazon are like, well, we want to have a cache of this in each of our um, availability zones so that we can serve all this traffic locally and it doesn't cost us bandwidth because uh, there's lots of FreeBSD machines. Um, but the way package has to be uh, the way package mirrors are handled now, they basically have to be controlled by the FreeBSD project and atomically updated. So mm -hmm. all the mirrors switch to the latest version at the same second. Otherwise, depending on where you get DNS routed, you might suddenly get different versions of the files with the same name, and that will cause the checksum failures. So uh, sorting that out so that we can use a CDN uh, will a, just improve the overall consistency and reduce the errors in package, but will also allow us to uh, serve the files more quickly uh, from CDNs and then and, and allow people to do local caches. You know, If you have a thousand of your own FreeBSD servers, you might want to use your own cache rather than uh, pulling all that over the internet just to save your own bandwidth, let alone to save the project's bandwidth. Do you know offhand, Alan, what um, uh, Linux distros say do for this kind of thing? Not off the top of my head, actually. 
Okay. My experience is that most Linux distros are using a network of volunteer mirrors. So at least when I was at the university, we set up and had a mirror that mirrored, well, FreeBSD, but also Debian and Ubuntu and EP, EP, EPEL packages for Fedora and stuff like that. But and, do, do they just not have this problem because they don't end up rebuilding packages within the same like release or version? I think or like my yeah, understanding with part... Debian is that like uh, when they add a package, a developer compiles it on their computer and uploads yeah, it. Yeah. And yep. then they just don't touch it again. They don't have the concept that FreeBSD does of, of using something like Pudrier and but, building everything in a clean environment. But there was, when syncing, first off, uh, at least for, for Debian and Ubuntu, uh, you pick, when you install them, you pick a specific mirror and you usually don't change the mirror uh, so that you know that you're hitting the same, the same machine for both metadata, metadata and packages. Uh, and when you are when you are a mirror, when you set up mirroring, uh, you usually mirror things in two stages. So first you mirror all the new packages, which I guess, well, you mirror all the new packages. I guess they have new names, but I can't remember. I have to check. Uh, yeah, there's and then, a, and a then you mirror the meta, Yeah, and then you mirror the metadata and then you remove the old things. Uh, so that the old metadata will give you an old package if you happen to to uh, run apt when uh, while it's updating. But once uh, it's first when the metadata is is updated that you will get the new packages basically. And I guess there is a window somewhere, but it's it's very yeah, small. Like and at least when I set it up, mirroring was done using rsync. So you picked a, another mirror, or if you were lucky, you got to, I guess, use the central source of truth, whatever. And then you run rsync, and you run it twice to get first the new packages and then the metadata. And I guess, I mean, when I, when I was running things, I think we were mirroring Debian or Ubuntu every four, six, or eight hours, I can remember. But between four and eight hours. And that, I mean, the mirrors were out of sync because I think I was mirroring from another mirror in, in, in Europe and that one was mirroring from, I guess, the source of truth for even if it was three months away. So. Yeah, there's a feature in rsync, uh, dash dash delayed dash update, which will yeah. basically download all the files into a hidden dot directory. Yeah. And, and then, then only once everything is synced, rename all the place yeah. at the end. Uh, and that can help with that type of thing. Uh, but yeah, like I think if you look at the way like the CentOS repo works, uh, they do something similar to uh, not uh, not the port effect, but I guess the port revision that we do. Uh, they would bump that every time they would recompile the package, basically. Yeah. Uh, and so the package gets a different file name every time they they modify it. But they generally compile the packages once for that release, and then don't touch the packages until they there's there's something to change about the software so it's, no. their repo would look more like our like um the freebsd release <laughs> underscore one repo for 12 that was these are all the packages compiled the day of the 12.1 release and then, yeah. then they don't get touched um so it'd be closer to that and then kind of manually replacing files in there uh if there's a security update or something kind of like our quarterly branch <laughs> And I mean, at least with the Red Hat, which is, I guess, CentOS also, I mean, they generally don't, up I guess there is a few exceptions like Firefox and stuff, uh, but they generally don't update versions. So if you are on, on uh, Red Hat 7, whatever, you still have to access to an old version of Apache or an old version of, of PHP. And sometimes, I guess, they add new versions, but... Uh, the old versions are still there, and they try to, or I guess they, they spend resources backporting security fixes to to unsupport to software that is not supported upstream. So, for instance, Apache might be a bad example example, but I use it anyway. They will backport fixes to their old version of Apache that is in the repository for for security things, even if upstream won't do it. 
Uh, at least that's, I mean, I might be wrong in the minor details, but at least that's that's my understanding. In, I mean, I've run into, I think on the, the Red Hat 7 something or other, uh, the Git version is like 1.8 or something. And you're like, well, that flag is not a random, that flag is not a random, that has changed because on FreeBSD, I think we're Git 2.28. So the official one is still, I think it was Git 1.8 or but something like that. And they just live, live, live with it. And I guess for, I, I've come to understand that Fedora is their sort of testing. And I guess things are a little more fresh there, but I have not run Fedora myself, so I don't know. And for, for Debian and Ubuntu, it's, it's virtually the same thing. Yeah, uh, so someone in the chat room was asking about the fact that, you know, we end up with a different uh, tarball for a package just because we rebuilt it. Most of the time, uh, I, I'm guessing that like the, the binary for uh, Git, for example, might not actually be different between the two package tarballs that are different. It's just things like timestamps and so on. And uh, our dependency tracking is generally, uh, if anything in anywhere in the dependency chain changes, we just delete all of those packages and rebuild them uh, to avoid not catching an update that we need to. So we're maybe overly pessimistic uh, about dependency stuff. So if any options change or any version changes on anything in the dependency tree, we just nuke all the leaves and all the, the branches um, in the tree and then rebuild everything that's missing. And I don't know how often our package builders do a complete fresh build rather than just incremental. Uh, uh, but... I'm, unsure, I'm unsure as well. For current, it seems like well, it does a fresh Fresh rebuild every time uh, the previous version is bumped. Yeah. So for that's current, true. that's at least usually once a week or once every two weeks. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, for current, I imagine almost all of the builds are yeah. completely fresh. Uh, for twelve point one, uh, I don't know what the cadence is of incremental versus a, a full rebuild. Perhaps Rene is listening and will answer in the chat. Uh, so yeah, like most of those changes aren't going to trigger a package on your system to want to to reinstall because the version has stayed the same, and that's why we have the port revision um, tag in our ports that gets appended to the version number that allows us to say, you know, this is still Git one dot twelve dot whatever uh, whatever the version is, but something about it has changed, and we push to the next one. Uh, and then yes, uh, Lee Wen points out that you can get weird stuff like all of the Perl packages were compiled against 5.30, and now we changed the version of Perl to 5.32, uh, so we need to rebuild all of the, the Perl packages. But then all the Perl packages will be rebuilt, and at least PKG will detect that oh, this package has a this install package has the dependency has changed, so I need to reinstall it. Yep. Even if the version is not bumped for for uh, for for the summer use, yeah. And the Rene is answered. I guess for twelve point one, there is only a full rebuild if the patch level changes. Do we actually bump the FreeBSD version for the patch levels? I don't think so. Yep, we do. <laughs> At least. I don't think we do. At least if, the, at least if, the, uh, if it's a kernel update. Uh, because no, the, 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 I, the underscore, I, underscore FreeBSD version does not change on the stable branch at all, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, I don't think it does. I'm almost 100% sure it doesn't, because I use that as the name of our package repo, and it would mess things up if updating from P8 to P9 changed that number on us. Yeah, because 
when I update my, if there's a security update, I update my Pudier Yales, Pudier things that, yeah, things have changed, I need to rebuild everything. Right, it's it's actually using the, the uname string though, not the ABI version to detect that. It is? Yes. Okay. Uh, but yes, so Pudier does uh, trigger a rebuild uh, if the patch level changes, mm -hmm. that is true. Which would mean that the package builders would also do that. Would do the same, yes. I'm just trying to, yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing we don't actually bother configuring a, a manual one once a month or something just because it happens to uh, usually work out that we have to patch frequently enough to, to yeah. do that. And if we don't, then there's probably not a reason to throw away uh, the incremental stuff. Plus, you know, the ports tree tends to move forward at a pretty quick pace, um, yeah. meaning that a lot of things get rebuilt anyway. Yeah, but it's, you end up in a situation when you have to rebuild a VM. Yes. Because your DL server. I have um, definitely purposely tricked Pudrair into not rebuilding in that case. <laughs> yeah. Can do it. And also to follow up based on the discussion on IRC, uh, generally, if I, if the shared li library version, at least the shared library major version, is changed, then you have to, if, if libfoo's shared library version changes, goes from libfoo.so.1 to, lib, to libfoo.so.2, then you have to forcefully bump the port revision on all ports that depend on libfoo to trigger trigger them to rebuild because they want to take that uh, since libfoo is the libfoo they want to take that change but if you added a new port that was libfoo 2 and made all ports track that one as a dependency instead then pkg would automatically detect uh, detect it and update i hope that makes made at least a little sense but yeah, for, for shared library bump, version bumps, you still have to bump port revision for all ports. But if, as, such as if an update to the Perl version, then that's automatically detected. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, before we wrap up. Nice. Another reminder as well, um, the import of OpenZFS into FreeBSD has some testing images out and be very helpful if uh, people could start testing that, as I expect that will be landing in FreeBSD current. Uh, relatively soon, and the smoother that goes, the better. Yeah, definitely uh, encourage folks who uh, are able to to give those a try and make sure that it'll um, be smooth when it, it actually lands. Just finished the file of the a version of that with that standard uh, mixed in as well. Uh, so going to be booting that in the VM later. Lots more good stuff coming in to try out. Uh, hopefully, you know, it's, it's odd because, you know, there's been versions of FreeBSD with that standard for a long time, but, uh, they were never as good as this one because it's actually finished now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, uh, LLVM was updated in previous current, and that has caused some uh, uh, issues in ports. So if you run into any issues compiling, it's usually a duplicated symbol, something or other. Uh, file a PR and 
there is a meta PR for uh, to track all those uh, issues. So file a bug issue and bug so on. Hopefully, hopefully someone will fix it. Yeah, well, someone will fix it, but hopefully someone will fix it fast. Uh, I think it was Kyle Evans actually who's in the chat room here who did a bunch of the work on uh, the base system to update uh, for yeah. the the no common stuff, uh, knowing that you know in the next couple of months that that clang update was coming. Yeah, but for some reason ports were missed. Yeah, this was definitely a little bit of a rockier uh, tool chain update yeah. um, uh, than we've had uh, in the past. I think most of the major things like bin utils and stuff like that are taken care of by now. But there are for sure a lot of a lot of ports still that that are failing that are fairly deep within dependency machines that's causing pieces of the port to not be compiled currently. Yeah, this, there's always a um, uh, a bit of a challenge figuring out just how um, how long to wait or how how much yeah. needs to be um, be addressed before a change like this comes in. But I think I think here we definitely uh, ended up with a new compiler a little earlier than um, than really was uh, was warranted. Um, I think having you know <laughs> having uh, Toolchain components like bin utils and um, having package itself be able to build with a new compiler is is a pretty key kind of basic uh, you know bare level uh, or or basic level of, of functionality that needs to be there before it it arrives. Uh, there was also a question about uh, some patches Edward Navarala had done uh, to be able to build ZFS-based VM images out of the release process. Uh, I have to look at the the. There's a concern about the reproducibility. Uh, I have to look at that, but I think we could probably uh, make it work how we'd like. Um, there is support in the newer OpenZFS that's landing, and I think our current ZFS, to do um, temporary pool names and so on, uh, so that you can um, build the pool with a certain name. Uh, so that, like, when you're importing the pool to actually fill it with files on your build system, that it can use a temporary name, but it will result in the pool on disk using the correct name. Uh, this allows you to, for example, build um, the VM image, so it'll have the default name that the installer uses as the pool name, even on a system where that pool name is already in use because you know your developer workstation was built with the installer, uh, and so on. And that would let us ideally, I think, have a reproducible build. Although it depends what level of reproducible you want, I guess. Like uh, I imagine in ZFS, there are a lot of numbers that are randomly generated when you create a new pool. Like, uh, Ed, for the reproducibility work that you did, like, do we generate a UFS file system that is bit for bit identical a month later? Um, you mean for um, like generating VM for gen ISO. images? No. So um, my my focus on reproducibility work um, was primarily um, the base system and package sets. Right, the, the individual um, files. Yeah, not not the generated file systems. Um, there is support in um, MakeFS, MakeISOFS, those sorts of things uh, to to accommodate reproducibility. Uh, I'm not sure it's 100% uh, there. So, I mean, certainly that is something that needs to get looked at as a second uh, um, a second right. pass. And I think that would be very challenging to do in ZFS. Yeah, that's that's Even a, a like really good point. You'd have to have like the same object numbers, like the inode numbers would have to be assigned in the same order in order to get everything to be the same. Yeah, it works. It works well for us for ZFS or for UFS rather, um, because MakeFS just can can you know it builds the file system out of whole cloth and and right. um, we can in user space and we can 
do whatever we need to 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 put reproducibility hooks in. Um, there's no fundamental reason ZFS couldn't do the same same thing, but um, you know, not having a user space ZFS creator image creator um, with hooks in to to store all of those things would be uh, makes it somewhat difficult. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for your questions and everyone who joined uh, on the stream here or in the chat room uh, for helping ask and answer questions. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll do this again sometime. And uh, I think Ed is hoping to do uh, one on the Git transition uh, some point soonish, right? Yeah, next week or the week after, uh, okay. we'll we'll have one dedicated uh, entirely to the Git transition and workflow and tooling and all kinds of good things. Oh, looking forward to that. Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next time.